Welcome, everyone, to the third episode of The Wild World of Bees. My name is Lincoln Best. I'm the taxonomist for the Oregon Bee Atlas, and I'm your host for The Wild World of Bees. This is an online lecture series you can enjoy from home to learn about the incredible incredible diversity and lives of wild bees. Through this series, we'll hear from great bee researchers and advocates from around North America, but with a focus closer to us here in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon. This series is brought to you by the Oregon Bee Atlas, an initiative to document the bee fauna of Oregon. The Atlas is the biodiversity focused arm of the Oregon Bee Project, a partnership between OSU Extension, the Oregon Department of Forestry, and the Oregon Department of Agriculture. This series is also sponsored by Mount Pisgah Arboretum in Eugene, Oregon, a great place to observe flowering plants and the Arboretum's local bee fauna. In last week's episode, I had the pleasure of introducing the Bee Atlas, where it's come from, what we've discovered, and where it's headed. I'm excited to introduce Cass Urban Mead this week, PhD researcher at Cornell University. And Cass's research looks at forests, the resources they produce that support bees, and how the forests and bees interact with orchards over space and time. Now, if you haven't had the opportunity, check out her episode on the Pollination Podcast. It's riveting. And please save your questions to the end or type them into the chat box. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Cass. Welcome, Cass. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, wonderful. Hi, everyone. I'll share my screen here. And hopefully that went through. I'll make it full screen. All right. Um, thank you so much, Link, for that introduction. Um, I'll try to speak clearly. I'm just going to check the chat in case these are any starting things. All right, looking good. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful. So um, as Link said, my name is Cass Urban Mead, and I am a graduate student, um, PhD candidate at Cornell University. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to jump right in here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am really honored to be here tonight to give this outreach talk on the oft overlooked role that trees hold for bees. Um, let's just, there we are. All right, got it. All right, and I am in Ithaca. All right, um, so actually I did want to begin by acknowledging that the land here in Ithaca where I live and work is the land of the Cayuga people of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. All right, with that in mind, I'm gonna introduce my title. So if you heard my podcast with Andoni, which was really a joy, um, I called, I talk about the bees and the trees. Um, but not only do I like puns, but I really like alliteration. Um, so I'm starting here with uh, the hymenopterans and the height, so please bear with me. Um, so by hymenopterans, I'm referring to the order of insects with membranous wings, uh, which include bees. If you've ever seen a bee, that makes sense, hopefully. In the heights, uh, I'm specifically referencing the role of temperate canopies. And tonight I'll talk a little bit about non-floral resources offered by forests for bees, including nesting and resin and some other cool interactions. And then I'll turn my attention to floral resources, including um, pollen and nectar. And uh, that's where I hope that I'll have some stories that might surprise you. So we're a lot of bee enthusiasts in the audience. Um, so probably this may be a bit of a review, but I first want to make sure that we're all on the same page about who the bees are that we're discussing. So I like to think of bees as fuzzy vegetarian wasps. The first bee that usually jumps into our mind is Apis mellifera, the European honeybee. And the European honeybee first arrived in the early 1600s with the colonists and similarly spread westward. Um, as a reminder, with the fuzzy vegetarian wasps, I want to highlight that bees are pollen eaters, not just pollinators, a pun that I am not responsible for and should give credit to many other pollination biologists before me. But bees are covered in fuzzy branched hairs adopted for carrying pollen back to the nest where they, where they rear their young. So my first bee love was the honeybee. And similarly, I adore chickens and I eat eggs pretty much every morning. I draw this parallel here. 
squiggly equals sign, uh, to remind us that it is best to think of the honeybee as a domestic agricultural species, which relies on human management. Its management is similarly subject to national and global scale trends in agriculture, and it lives at a complicated nexus where its intimate relationships with people can sometimes conflict with the conservation needs of wild species. So we want to be really careful to remember that just as protecting and keeping chickens does not protect wild birds. Similarly, when we work to take care of our beloved domesticated honeybees, it's not always the same project as protecting wild bees and other insects. So what do we mean by wild bees? Um, if you're a member of the Oregon Bee Atlas or another bee researcher, you're probably enormously familiar with this, but we have over 4,000 species of wild bees in the United States and over 20,000 species in the world. The visual beauty, um, the visual strikingness and just absolute beauty of these wild bees continues to astonish me. And um, these gorgeous photos of Sam Drogi I've in, uh, included illustrate some of that beauty and diversity. So um, I'm not on the West Coast. I am in Ithaca, New York. And here where I work, um, when we look outside the honeybee box to think about our bees, uh, as of about, I think it was, I usually say last year, but I think it was two years ago now, we're up to 417 species of wild bees. And honeybees are only one of the 15 species that are both social and cavity nesters, such as a hive. And here you can see that besides that lighter blue chunk that is the large number of kleptoparasitic bees, the largest proportion of wild bees we have are solitarily dwelling ground nesting bees. And someone from the Oregon Bee Atlas should correct me or, or update later, but my understanding is there are at least 500 species of wild bees in Oregon. Most bees are solitary and only active for a few weeks of the whole year. Here you can see a life cycle diagram from the Xerces Society of a solitary soil dwelling wild bee. We usually only see that adult phase where the bee is visiting the flower. Yet the majority of the bee's life will be in its small cell underground or in a nest or a plant stem and in, or a rotting log, developing on the ball of pollen that was carefully provisioned by it, for it. Many of these bees, including many of the regular forest bees that I will discuss, will only be active for a few weeks of the year. So, all right, with that out of the way, I want to give you a little bit of insight of why in the world I started looking at forest canopies for bees. Um, and by do, to do so, I wanted to start by zooming out. Where do bees usually live? Where do we usually find them? So here's a map from a recent nature paper or um, where, where bees are most abundant and diverse worldwide. And indeed, when we think of bee biodiversity hotspots, we usually think of these great masses of floral resources, deserts, and Mediterranean climates. For example, whoops, jumped ahead. For example, desert blooms are astounding. And when you remember that the majority of bee nests are soil, solitary soil dwellers who are only out for a short period of time, it makes sense that they would have been evolved to thrive in arid habitats with these pulsed resources. And the dryness is important because these are places where their nests won't get drowned out by rains. Closer um, to at least where I live, although many of you may live near beautiful desert blooms, in the United States, we also often think of peak bee resources as meadows, fields, wildflower strips, and other plantings. These are undoubtedly crucial and vibrant resources for bees, and every flower and meadow and floral strip you come across um, provides both forage and nest resources. And yet, when I look in the literature, research repeatedly shows a positive trend, especially because I work um, primarily in agriculture before moving into the forest, that forests near agriculture support abundant and diverse bees. And um, we work in apple orchards in New York State here in the Danforth lab, and we repeatedly find patterns corroborating with this literature. So, um, for example, a 2016 paper by Joshi et al. even found that within an orchard row, the abundance of wild bees declined as you moved away from the forest edge. So if our hotspots, like I showed, the deserts and the meadows are so showy, why are there more bees in maybe these focal landscapes where we're worried about supporting bee habitats when there are forests nearby? What is it about these temperate forests that can drive higher abundance in nearby agricultural systems? Most specifically, I wanted to know 
what's going on in these forests, particularly their canopies, that might help us understand the bees in the trees. So for the rest of this talk, I'll focus on some forest specific resources for bees and we'll be drawing heavily on research that prior other researchers have done, um, including moving in finally to my own research. And then finally, I'll touch on at the end how to support forest bees. All right, so let's begin with some nesting resources. The most familiar and common example of bees in forests is probably that of honeybees nesting in cavities in forest trees. Uh, so remember that the honeybee in Europe um, is considered wild but feral here in the United States. Um, and if you've come across the amazing work of Tom Seeley tracking down um, the honeybees uh, living feral in the Arnott Forest that's nearby from here. So when we're able, please do come visit again. Um, and these are some photos of honeybees nesting in woodpecker cavities in beech trees in Germany. Uh, thinking about nesting also in social bees, I'm going to move quickly down from the canopy to highlight particularly bumblebees. Um, this time of year, at least on my coast, and a few weeks ago, I highlight how bumblebee queens are particularly seen nest searching in the litter, um, and forest understories are a crucial habitat for these forest bee nests. So is that the end of the story for canopy nesting? I want to tell you one cool story from my own work. I was surprised when tree climbing, let's see if my voice can carry over that small sound there. I'm just going to turn off the sound. There we go. Um, to observe canopy bees um, to find a vibrant nest of shiny green sweat bees. So this was 20 meters high in an oak tree in a local wood lot. And I was on a very sturdy branch, but this was one kind of punky dead wood. And um, who's in there is a vibrant nest of, I'm pretty sure, Agaclora pura. And you can see it just there sitting on that branch. I know videos are hard over Zoom. Um, but I wanted to show the video anyway, because I know that for uh, shiny green iridescent canopy bees, that's part of their design. Ecologists have noted across insect orders that forest dwelling insects are more likely to be brightly iridescent, perhaps, perhaps for predator avoidance in these habitats that are crisscrossed by light and shadow um, as trees move and sway. And this, um, this shiny green sweat bee, uh, if you're familiar with, with those bees, you'll know that they're abundant and common. I've also included a figure here from an interesting study by Mike Ulishin in 2010, who found season long, during season long canopy and understory trapping that Agaclora pura was abundant all summer in the canopy and made up up to 92% of his pan trapped community. So perhaps they too were nesting in that Georgia canopy. All right, so sticking with sweat bees, um, one more note on nesting in the forest. Um, I want to point out the understory analog to this oak branch in the sky, uh, which is coarse woody debris and other deadwood downed and, and uh, deadwood standing as snags. So many other insects, including this blue sweat bee, um, also nest in logs, um, will use abandoned bee burrows or carve out their own cavities. And sometimes single nests will even join together to form super nests. And you can see this really wonderful diagram of complex nest architecture excavated from within a rotting log from this Stockhammer 1967 paper. So those are highlighting some of the ways that forests are used both up high and down low as nesting resources. Before moving on to floral resources, let's talk about resin and honeydew, two more obscure perhaps, but also exciting forest canopy interactions. And I'll try to keep them properly in the canopy. So honeybee foragers for resin are shown here on the left, um, carrying resin on their nest, back to their nests to turn into propolis, the gluey substance they mix with saliva and beeswax to seal the edges of their nest. Um, Drescher and colleagues in Germany compared the chemical composition of bee collected resins to those in the surrounding environments found in plants and found that they primarily matched the chemical composition of bud resins from cottonwoods or poplars, birch and horse chestnut, and sap from the wounds of Norway spruce and Scots pine. So those aren't necessarily bees that jump to mind when you think of a bee tree or a tree that a bee is going to be on. And we know that this is not the full list, um, but is a good start of some of the trees that we know produce resins and others that we know when they wound produce sap that a bee may be collecting. 
Besides the structural uses of propolis, Simone Finstrom and Spivak in 2012 found that honeybees challenged with chalk brood increased their resin collection. Um, you can see in this graph that the unchallenged bees did not change their uh, resin foraging as much as those bees that were challenged with chalk brood. You see that increase in the change in foraging. So further research from this group has begun to suggest that the resin may be a form of social immunity collected both prophylactically and therapeutically. So resin is really important both structurally and potentially as a self-medication or social immunity for health. All right, um, on to honeydew. I'm going to kind of try to overview these different topics just to highlight what the bees are doing up in the trees. So what is honeydew? Okay, honeydew is a really cool interaction. It's a nectar-like carbohydrate-rich excretion produced as a feeding byproduct by hemipterans. So bugs who are sucking on the plant um, then only want to take in the most important nutrients and they poop out all the sugary part. So that literally means that honeydew is the nice name we give for sugary true bug poop. Um, and it can sometimes be even more nutrient-rich than floral nectar. And um, so not only does this stingless bee in Panama collect it from tree hoppers and other uh, bugs in forest canopies, um, but honeybees collect honeydew and will make honey from it. And um, Requier and Leonard estimate that in Greece, 60% and in Turkey, up to 50% of honey is from honeydew, not from plant nectar. Um, so this is both a really exciting kind of volume of collection, um, but al and also can be economically important. So, okay, that's in Europe and that's about honeybees. Um, what about more locally? I know you guys are on the West Coast mostly. Um, the honeydew of scale insects is particularly treasured, I hear, from the incense cedar um, and in California and Oregon from early summer onwards. So if anyone has tried this honey, um, I would love to also, and I'd love to hear your reports of it. Um, it's often called pine honey, and I just wanted to highlight that um, Although the honeydew may be collected by a bee visiting um, a coniferous plant, it's not from the pine itself. It's actually from the secondary interaction through the bug. All right. And finally, because I said this is a talk about wild bees, um, oops, there we go. Um, I'm going to move away from honeybees one more time. And in 1993, Suzanne Batra contributed one of her really foundational observational papers, um, there are many of them, with a note on bumblebees congregating to collect honeydew from um, the pest species balsam twig aphid. And um, Batra pretty marvelously, you can see in the title here, called these gatherings distant alpine honeydew bonanzas. And um, I've included the members of, of those interactions here in these photos. Um, and then one more recent paper in 2017 um, found that in the Mediterranean, over 42 species of wild bees were found visiting non-showy, non-flowering shrubs, uh, which did have honeydew secretions on them. Um, so this is a phenomenon that goes far beyond honeybees, although we may have noticed it most importantly um, because of its production of honeydew honey. All right. So I hope that I've convinced you so far that for nesting, nest construction materials, self-medication, and as a sugar source through this cool tripartite relationship with true bugs, that there are many important uses for forests, um, many of them way up high, that we might forget when it comes to considering forest habitats. Um, Requier and Leonard, this 2020 paper I just referenced, estimate that 32% of bee species use non-floral resources as an additional nutrient source, nesting material, or to protect their nests and themselves. And many of these are drawn from forests, um, among other sources. So before we move on, one quick note on a final non-floral reason that bees might be up in canopies or hovering around trees. So this is mostly a fun hypothesis and a direction for cool future research. And I want to thank Nick Dorian at Tufts uh, for pointing me towards this 1980 source by Eichwart and Ginsberg, um, who notes that male mining bees in the genus Andrina, which is um, one of my most beloved spring foraging bees, um, will scent mark non-blooming trees as part of their patrolling circuits. Um, Nick Dorian has seen adult mining bees, um, same genus Andrina and cellophane bees and Calides, gathering around pitch pines in the early spring. Um, while I often see Andrina circulating on non-blooming oak trees um, and not yet open flowers. 
So could it be that these tall trees are ideal gathering sites as they prepare for mating? Um, that will be a fun direction for future research. Um, sweet. All right, so without further ado, uh, it is definitely time to pivot into tonight's star of the show, the floral resources provided by the forest and particularly its canopy. All right, so um, providing a little bit more background context, let's again just highlight that bees are not just pollinators, but pollen eaters. And it helps to clarify that these bees, the pollen eating cousins of the wasp, are properly herbivores. Indeed, they are eating the pollen, um, this reproductive part of the plant. So bees work all day to collect large amounts of pollen and nectar, such as those seen here in this osmia nest uh, on the left there. And bees will mix together this pollen to provide the macro and micronutrients needed for bee development. And pollen itself provides most of the protein um, for growth and development of a baby bee. The plants, on the other hand, would really have liked to have that pollen go into the reproduction of their own nuts, seeds, and fruits. But the bees have figured out, uh, really quite marvelously, how to very efficiently pack it all up and bring it home. Sometimes they're even more efficient and hardly deposit any at all. Um, so the fact that the bees aren't trying to take the pollen in order to help the bees reproduce, but in order to take it home to be a nutrient source to rear their own young, sets the stage for the fact that there may be some unexpected host plants um, that I'll discuss later on in this talk, particularly wind pollinated species. All right, so when you came to hear this talk uh, via your computer tonight, um, and you were thinking about bees in the trees, um, maybe you imagined black cherry, your backyard amelanchier, your service berry, or your dogwood, um, or an agroforestry hedgerow of black locust, um, or maybe even a flowering tulip tree. And if you did, you're absolutely right. Um, these trees are insect pollinated trees, which provide a nectar reward for their pollinators, in addition to the pollen that the bees are collecting to take home. Um, and this time of year, um, although it snowed yesterday uh, and the day before, it is somehow in between all of that trying to be spring and these bees are fully abuzz. So it is always a good move to support these and other flowering trees on your landscape. Uh, and we know that they are a wonderful resource for our flowering trees, flower for our bees on the trees. I also want to highlight two really cool genera that have been known for a while to provide important resources for bees. Um, and we call these two, gen um, many of the individuals within these two genera, ambophilus, or partially insect and partially wind pollinated, um, maples and willows. So some species and some varieties um, are one of other, and despite partial wind pollination, pollination in some species, um, which is usually associated with the loss of nectar, many of these species will still produce nectar as a reward, um, a nectar reward as a legacy um, of continued or partial reliance on insects. So red maple is one of my first early bloomers that I always watch in the spring. And again, Suzanne Batra has a really exciting paper from 1985 where she quantified the amount of pollen and nectar in the outer part of a, of a tree, of a, a red maple tree. And so she says, a vigorous flowering tree in full bloom sampled at noon bore about 1,350 flowers per meters cubed of outer two meters of canopy, so the outside of the tree, yielding also an estimate of 1.35 milliliters of nectar per cubic meter of canopy. That is a lot of bee food. Um, and it's a little bit tricky to imagine exactly what that means, but when we kind of zoom out and think about all of these different species, that could be quite a lot of pollen. So, um, Maple and willow both have many bees that will visit them in the early spring and willow has many specialist bees. I also want to turn to some less traditionally recognized bee trees, um, although some of them have already been highlighted earlier as resin or honeydew sources or nesting. Um, in contrast to the insect pollinated uh, trees and other plants, uh, wind pollinated trees are usually dioecious, meaning that the pollen and seed producing flowers are in different individual plants. 
For example, if you look at this willow on top, uh, the pollen producing flower is on the left and the flowers that will become seeds after pollination are on the right. Um, the large picture on the right, which I took, um, are the pollen producing sugar maple flowers. And in oak, um, this partitioning happens on the same twig. The pollen producing catkin is separated on the branch from the flower that will, after pollination, um, hopefully become an acorn. So um, wind pollinated trees need to produce a large volume of really light pollen that can be easily airborne um, in order to ensure that it can circulate on air currents and find the correct seed producing flower. Um, so uh, folks with allergies, unfortunately, may find this slide both utterly believable and um, potentially vaguely distressing. Um, when we think about the early spring, which is the time of year that I do most of my research, um, I found this 1996 paper by Molina et al. Um, that estimate that oak volumes, uh, numbers of pollen can reach towards a trillion grains of pollen per tree. Um, I have rewritten the labels on this, on this um, graph so they are more easily readable. And you can see at the top here that these amounts across the y-axis are multiplied by uh, one billion. Just second guessed myself there with the trillion and the million and the billion. Um, so um, that's an enormous amount of pollen. Um, as a skeptic and as a scientist, although perhaps that's redundant, um, I decided to see if I really agreed with those numbers because they seemed obscene. Um, so I started with my sugar maple in my backyard and counted um, a bunch of different flowers to see how many anthers, um, the pollen producing part of the plant, the anther is at the end of the stamen, um, there were per flower, how many flowers there were per flower cluster, which was what I called these kind of jellyfish like blobs you can see on the far right here. Um, you know, if you've looked at any of the maples in your yard, you'll, you'll see that they, they kind of have the dangling flower parts below. Um, then I counted how many clusters there were per branch, how many branches there were per tree in order to get a final estimate of how many anthers there were on each tree. Um, and I counted multiples of each and they're averaged. Um, so um, this sugar maple ended up, when I multiplied these together, uh, 3.2 times 10 to the sixth um, uh, anthers per tree. And similarly, um, red maple had a slightly different distribution of anthers per flower and flowers per cluster. But interestingly, of the mid-sized subcanopy trees that I was counting, I did end up with similar numbers of anthers per tree. Um, so those are really big numbers. Um, but of course, if we remember that figure, I was just showing you what I really wanted to know were the number of pollen grains per tree. So last year when I had access to the lab, I had hoped to do this for more species this spring. Um, I took mature anthers from a silver maple, um, suspended them and sonicated them in liquid and counted subsamples of known volumes. So then I could multiply those back up to get an estimate of the number of pollen grains per anther. And um, so that was to add to this part of this equation here. So this number was huge. Um, after multiplying the number of anthers per tree by 2300 um, pollen grains per anther, I found the total of 2.3 to the order of 10. Um, and so this one example that I calculated and shared with you um, as an interesting anecdote, I thought is roughly the same order of magnitude as these astonishing numbers um, from 1996. So then of course, imagine multiplying that number out across the forest. Um, personally, I've always found wind pollination to be a bit statistically improbable and thus marvelous. Um, but the fact that the right pollen grain could find the right receptive flower has begun to make more sense to me since I've hand counted all of these numbers of really how many pollen grains are out there. Um, it's a really pretty cool project. Okay, but these numbers, you may say, cool, that's a lot of pollen casts, nice job, you counted it, but these, um, these numbers only matter if the bees are collecting it. Um, and so one way that I started to answer this question was um, just to see if there's evidence in the literature of bees collecting wind pollinated pollen. Um, and I have found that when you start looking, you find it all over the place. My personal journey on this project began 
um, not just because I love bees and agriculture and forests, but also um, because Laura Rousseau, a former Danforth lab postdoc and now professor, found high amounts of large amounts of wind pollinated tree pollen in the pollen loads of wild bees who were visiting apple blossoms in the middle of apple bloom. Um, and so that was really interesting. And a recent review paper by Saunders et al. found um, a highlighted wind pollinated pollen collection. Um, all of these images you see are from that paper. And over 70% of the records that she found were from indirect pollen analysis, such as in hives, nest provisions, um, or off of insect bodies, which absolutely highlights the need for more direct observational studies of uh, plant pollinator interactions. So um, there were over 200 visitation records in her review um, for 101 wind pollinated genera across 25 families. I'm reading from the slide here. And four out of 12 of those, interestingly, were gymnosperm genera and almost half were grasses and sedges. And I've had really a lot of fun going back in old records and spotting places where wind pollinated pollen collection um, is is explicit and quite large. Uh, one really fun record is this 1945 nature paper um, whose data I, I graphed, but the, but the numbers are directly from this paper, um, carried by four mining bee species and showing nearly exclusive collection. Um, uh, these are Andrina species of oak, beech, maple, and chestnut pollen. So, um, there's definitely lots of anecdotal evidence that these bees are collecting it. Um, and in many cases, uh, the, the data like these papers from Chambers also show successful development of those larvae into adults. Um, I also wanted to highlight one very cool study from 2012. Um, one of the only studies that has looked at canopy pollen and then asked about the population level implications of canopy bloom uh, was this 2012 paper by Inari et al, which was in a temperate Japanese forest. So a pretty similar ecosystem to where I am in the Northeast. Um, and they found that uh, the quantity of canopy pollen in a maple and oak dominated forest was uh, strongly correlated with the, num the bumblebee abundance the following year. So those were bumblebee queens who would have been provisioned during the year when the canopy was highly abundant um, or not and similarly correlated. And in fact, the subsequent pollination success of a bumblebee pollinated understory flower the following year. Um, and I have not found studies of this sort um, in North America, but I think it's a really cool direction to go to understand what these implications may be. Um, so the major reason that a lot of these dynamics have not been explored in more depth has to do uh, primarily with access. Um, I like to say that they're primarily overlooked because they're overlooking us. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, I took this video from up in the canopy of a flower fly visiting pollen producing flowers. And you may be able to see it probing for nectar rewards um, among these pollen, pollen producing stamens. All right. Um, there we go. It was a very beautiful day. There were hardly any days like that for red maple this year. Marvelous. All right, so um, part of my work has been climbing to explore these dynamics in the Finger Lakes region in New York State. Um, many people do canopy access with cranes and this is a much more uh, developed field of research in tropical canopies. Um, and uh, I just want to give credit here to my marvelous fieldwork safety buddies who were on the ground and not pictured. Um, and so the first thing that I wanted to do with this climbing was simply to uh, get a lot more observations to see what is happening up in the canopy to see if I could do more of that direct connecting of the dots of um, the, the connections that we're seeing anecdotally through nesting provisions. And um, First, just some canopy netting anecdotes. Um, I actually took this photograph yesterday. Um, and, uh, oh, okay, I'm reading the chat. Um, is that something I should, should I adjust what I'm doing here? 
All right, um, we will get to the questions at the end, I think is how I understand it. Um, okay, great. Thanks everyone. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to chatting. Um, all right, so um, some of my major observations during canopy netting um, definitely underscore the trickiness of this endeavor. Um, I understand why it has not been done enormously in temperate canopies thus far. Um, due to branch sturdiness and um, the abundance of which species are um, in the nearby woodlots where I've been had access to climb most regularly, I've done most of my sky high observations um, on red and sugar maple and on um, predominantly red oaks. Um, and on multiple afternoons, I have watched these trees, um, particularly on warm and sunny days, alive with insects. Um, one trend that has impeded standardized netting is that I've observed that the larger insects, including bumblebees and carpenter bees, who I can identify by eye, although often they're only silhouettes against the sky from my position closer in more safely um, within the tree, um, is that those larger bees are predominantly on the outside of the canopy, while the smaller bees, the andrina, the lazia glossum, or sweat bees, the flower flies, the calides, the cellophane bees, um, more often, more willingly venture to the inner branches. Um, uh, which I have not fully quantified, but is a really interesting trend and also would bias netting samples um, and are very difficult to reach even with an extended net and even with kind of trying to do more sophisticated climbing to the outer portions of the branch of the, um, of the tree. Finally, um, it's also um, much windier higher up, um, and I've discovered that days that seem perfect from the ground are in fact quite untenable in the canopy. Um, and this makes the physiological and feet of high flying bees all the more impressive. Um, and one phenomenon that um, anybody who's tried to collect or watch or do counts on bees at ground level, um, which is that bees especially if it gets very windy or if a really big cloud goes overhead, it gets cool for a moment, the bees will, will stop and, and you'll see many fewer of them. Um, this is pretty extreme in the canopy um, and can make a tree that has clearly had insect activity just a few moments ago um, have very low yield in terms of observations per minute. So um, this was really interesting. This is not a problem and doesn't mean that the bees aren't up there, um, but is a challenge for standardized collecting um, and also I think worth sharing as a story um, because of what it tells us about uh, bee behavior in the canopy and how the physiological constraints of this windier, more variable, um, often colder even than the understory habitat um, can affect bee behavior. So um, although I continue to climb um, to uh, get anecdotal evidence, and um, I was happy to be, to be up in the tree yesterday, very, very socially isolated, um, I have also been setting pan traps um, to get more standardized collections in the canopy. So um, advanced, there we are. Um, I set over 55 trees across multiple woodlots in the Finger Lakes region. Um, I'm not going to talk about my orchard research today, but um, all of these forested areas were adjacent to orchards so that we can understand the interplay of those habitats near each other. Um, so many of these are second growth forests um, that are marginally managed, um, mostly not managed at all. Um, and so you can see here, and uh, Andoni mentioned to me that uh, some people have, have listened to the podcast, so you may have heard of this giant slingshot. Uh, here it is in action on the far left. Uh, it's a seven feet long and has a giant bungee and is, is the strategy to launch the weights up in the tree that allow me to rig up a pulley system. Um, and if you've used pan trapping, uh, these familiar blue, white, and yellow cups I've adapted for canopy sampling. And, um, and I paired each, each sample, both in the canopy and in the understory. Um, and uh, canopy traps were not visible from the ground. So although pan trapping is an active measure of, me um, measure of an active sampling metric, um, bees would not be found in the traps, we do not think, unless they had already been in the canopy. So I have found over 70 species of bees in the canopy and the understory and found that there were not really that striking of differences in the species composition between the canopy and the understory, suggesting that bees were moving freely and frequently across strata. And uh, to understand the consumption patterns of these bees, I am currently in the process of identifying the pollen 
consumed by these bees. So I'll keep you up to date on those um, points. But the consistently high abundance of bees um, across species and genera, um, especially large numbers of mining bees, uh, Lasia glossum, uh, and other species, which I'm happy to discuss more in detail later on, uh, suggests really vibrant forest communities. And many of them were forest nesting species. So this brings us to challenges with understanding these tree resources, even if the bees are extraordinarily active in these trees, uh, and we know that they're visiting them. Um, there is nutritional uncertainty in the, the quality of the resources that the bees are collecting. For example, prior research has shown that bees don't develop well on only pine pollen, um, yet uh, there are really high crude pollen amounts in many genera, um, including many wind pollinated genera, suggesting that they could provide uh, large amounts of protein. And some stoichiometric uh, papers that look at nutrient ratios have found that some wind pollinated species um, should match at least the nutrient ratios that you would expect. Um, and research from Vaudo et al. and some other groups have shown that bees are carefully balancing their ratios of pollen, of protein and lipids um, and other micronutrients, even amino acid num um, amounts based on the pollen available to them. These earlier anecdotal uh, evidences, I'm here on point two under nutritional uncertainty now, um, have shown that there are multiple instances of successful osmia larval development um, on provisions of up to 95% oak. Uh, there are cons evidence of consistently full loads of oak and beech and other pollen and mining bees, and studies that, again, are not specifically looking at this question, but do show that bees have developed um, vibrant and healthy large numbers of offspring on pollen, including, for example, this one study that used Acer Nagundo. So um, it seems likely, although for future research should show um, whether or not uh, bees can develop as successfully on our common um, uh, wind pollinated species, we could use more explicit tests of that um, in the laboratory, um, hopefully once laboratory research is able to resume. And one really interesting thing is this high weather dependency, the wind dependency that I mentioned before. Um, there were days where I've been watching a specific oak tree, I'm here on point two now, um, for several days waiting for it to be the perfect day. And sometimes that becomes a day where then that oak tree is a buzz and there are bees all over it. Um, and other days, the, the day that that pollen became mature, uh, seems to be also a day that it drenches rain and then um, those catkins never seem to really be something that's going to be accessible to those bees. So, so cold and variable springs such as this spring for example or really hardly any sunny days um, makes us very variable. And one other really interesting dynamic um, that, I'm, that I've been tracking in my woodlots is the presence of math blooms. So a mast blooming species is one where all of this, the, the trees of the same species in a region will bloom at the same time. This is familiar with oaks um, where we are this year. All of the acorns are germinating because last year was a mast bloom year. Um, and so even if a species is an incredible resource, not every species will bloom every year. Um, leading to some variability in the degree to which we're certain to find that resource for a bee. And so what would that mean in terms of population dynamics if it is a bee that is very dependent on oak, but then uh, the next year there's hardly any within that region. Um, uh, and so you would think that that might lead to some really cool bet hedging. And it is hard to predict how climate change might change any uh, patterns of bee behavior as they settle in. Um, to their use of that oak or other species. All right, so to get around some of these questions, but knowing how many resources there are in forest and seeing these consistently positive uh, relationships with forest and agriculture, what should you do as a manager? And we are at 1045. So, oh, sorry, I'm in the East Coast. We are at 745. So I hope that um, it's okay if I take just a few minutes to talk about management and then we can move on to questions. Um, 
So I'm obviously on the East Coast and, whoops, should advance the slide here. There we go. Um, so I definitely want to highlight that there are lots of wonderful um, people, specifically uh, groups right in Oregon, um, who are doing research on forest bees um, in your ecosystem specifically. But um, there are some really general recommendations that I think uh, we can use more broadly. So um, let's see. First, I'll just do a recap um, of why trees for bees, which will help motivate the logic for how we would manage. So there are um, the non-floral resources we reviewed, such as um, honeydew, uh, resins, and direct nesting in forest habitats. And then um, mating sites as a possible direction to explore. We know bees are uh, swirling around trees without clearly collecting something frequently. Uh, and so, so what are they using those, those sites for? And then, um, as we've discussed, nectar and pollen are available in enormous volumes in a given tree. Um, and uh, so they should not be overlooked just because they overlook us. Um, but how do we think about the fact that some species are blooming just as flickers of a day or two or maybe not every year, despite that enormous uh, resource availability when you catch them at the right time? Um, wonderful. And many, many other researchers have highlighted um, the relationships between uh, spring ephemerals and the specialist bees and generalist bees who use understory blooming plants. Um, and that is not the subject of the talk today, but, but they are absolutely incredible resources. So, all right, if you have a woodlot, um, the clearest thing to think about managing for when you think of all of these different needs that bees have is diversity of tree types. So diversity at all levels, diversity of canopy, diversity across the landscape. And um, in this framework, I always recommend working with a forester and thinking about how management for birds and other wildlife dovetails with that of bees. Um, I also um, want to highlight the work of Jim Rivers and Sarah Galbraith and others uh, on the West Coast who are looking specifically at forest management, the effects of fire regimes, the effects of uh, clearing and coarse woody debris removal um, on how bee communities respond. Um, but we know that forests historically are adapted to disturbance, that early successional habitat uh, used to be much more common um, due to fires, due to uh, wind events, and so recreating patches of early successional habitat on the landscape that then will move through its stages of development allows for that variability in habitat type across the landscape to support lots of different species of trees that provide all the different resources we've discussed, as well as at different stages. Uh, similarly, in forestry, we often call this uneven aged management uh, within a woodlot where you're having multiple ages of trees that leads to diversity of strata and developmental stage. You want to protect, uh, keep coarse woody debris, which are, can be explicit nesting sites, as well as snags and standing deadwood. And to protect your understory species for both forest regeneration and, of course, for the, for the beautiful and high resource spring ephemerals, which support generalist and specialist species alike. Okay, what if you don't have a forest, um, a woodlot, and you're not a forester? Um, uh, things that are really important in agricultural landscapes are hedgerows, which of course we know are also very important for wind pe as pesticide buffers and for soil retention and water management. Um, we'd love to keep soft edges, uh, such as uh, these transitions between maybe a managed forest area and an agricultural landscape, those shrubby sides of fields and edges uh, where you'll have lots of good, you think also about bird nesting habitat and other resources, those are all places that bees will nest. And of course, even if you have just a backyard, you can do a ton of things. And don't forget when you're planting your perennial garden or your beautiful wildflower garden to always also add trees. Um, wonderful. So with that in mind, um, I would love um, to open it up for questions and touch on anything that you're excited about. Um, and there we are. Uh, thank you so much. Are there any questions? Oh, thank you, Cass. That was fascinating. We do have a few questions. Sure. Yeah, I'm not used to the Q&A feature, so I saw it flashing but wasn't sure how to access it. 
That's all right. I can pose them to you. So from Diane, we have, do native bees use the honeydew of aphids on roses for food? Um, I do not know specifically about that, but I would assume so. <laughs> if they can find them and cue into those chemical cues um, or smell them, smell the sugars in them, um, I would absolutely imagine that they're collecting them. But if you end up seeing that happen, uh, I'm sure that we would all love, love to see photos or get to know. Yeah, fun. Great. So if anyone has any questions, if you look on the bottom of the screen, you'll see a Q&A feature. You can use that to type in your questions and then we'll get to them. So from Paul, does the taste of honey reflect the type of pollen available during their early spring buildup? And might hazelnut tree pollen influence the taste of honey produced in that same area? So, so the question is not about whether the type of nectar or the, the floral resource necessarily, but just other pollen in the ecosystem or if they're also collecting from another tree? I, think it's... Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that honey, we definitely think of as having distinctive flavors, depending on which, which tree it comes from um, or which flowers, but I am not sure um, if just the pollen from another species would change that, that taste. Um, but we could do some taste tests. Um, I've also been watching hazelnuts as much as I can and have not seen as many bees um, as I expected, but I think that might be my fault for not getting out enough. So um, everyone who's, who's growing hazelnut, uh, let's collect those records for sure. Yeah, it's not easy sometimes. Um, from Susan, have cameras been used in various locations within the inner and outer portion of the tree to catalog bee species? Not to my knowledge, no. Um, there's definitely interesting use of um, canopy trapping for lots of wildlife, specifically in tropical regions, but I don't know of anyone in temperate, temperate areas. Um. From Christine, do we have figures or estimates of the pollen volume for Acer macrophyllum, the big leaf maple? I would love to do that. Um, I love seeing big leaf maple on my few, few trips I've been um, out to the West Coast, but um, that's not an acer that I have access to out here. Um, and so I have not had the chance to count it. But, you know, besides the pollen part, it just takes a few very uncomfortable hours craning your neck if you're not climbing uh, to count, to do that, those counts. So uh, if you get those numbers, it would be fun to cross-reference. That's a great idea. Mm-hmm. Let's see, from Sarah, do bees in urban areas also use these resources? That's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm really sorry I didn't talk about urban resources. So I love the urban forest. Um, I think uh, it's really uh, an incredible resource for all the reasons we know urban forests are wonderful. Um, but uh, absolutely, there is a paper that I can track down um, um, MacGyver's group in Toronto is jumping to my mind, but I'm not sure that's actually the paper that I'm thinking of. Um, but I can send out later, uh, maybe Tandoni or Link, um, the papers that have looked at uh, and estimated the floral resources provided by um, trees in urban areas. Um, and I think new challenges arise in terms of um, specifically maybe uh, insecticide uh, um, access through pollen and nectar or um, dominance of a couple species. I know, you know, urban foresters work really hard to diversify the urban forest canopy, um, but that can be a challenge uh, based on other constraints of planting and species. So um, it's a whole new series of questions, but bees are certainly going to be using them. Um, and, and we get different, different communities of bees in urban areas often, um, similarly vibrant, but often a different cross-section, so it could be really fun to compare the regional community in an urban area on the same species as, as more, more wild. That's been done on, um, on herbaceous crops for sure. All right, yes, go ahead. Right. Uh, let's see, from Christina, has there been any consideration given to sharing some of the fascinating research to private landowners who practice clear cutting and to encourage them to use different practices to help save the bees? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, forest management is complicated and 
you know, people manage their forests in different ways for lots of different reasons. Um, and I think that all the incredible work that community forestry, that ecological forestry, um, all of those folks are doing to do outreach um, is absolutely a part of it. And, and I think that one thing that I get really excited about um, is whenever I do read or go to forest conferences and see um, other conversations about ecological forestry to manage for species diversity, to manage for forest health, to manage for birds, that many of those recommendations are are synergistic at least with what the intuition for a healthy forest recommendation would be. So, so I would say maybe not explicitly. Um, and um, I think that the, that the successful communication for those healthy forest managements can, can be thought of as just adding the bees to that list uh, in a really exciting way. Hopefully that at least gets kind of towards that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of different managers out there. Absolutely. So let's see, from Maureen, I have many fruit trees and they bloom at the same time. Bees seem to prefer apples and pear over cherries. Why would this be? Ooh. I don't know. I think of cherries as good bee trees. So it may be something to do with relative abundance and bees learning, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It might be something um, maybe variety or cultivar specific that might be worth looking into the nectar production or, or something specific about your cherry variety. But yeah, I'm not sure. From Cassie, on, on the slide, 70 species found in the canopy. Is there mm -hmm. a comparative slide for species in the area that aren't specifically in the canopy? Yeah, sorry. I didn't dive too much into that um, just because I didn't want to get into the weeds, but um, yeah, absolutely. So um, we have about, um, I've often been looking at those communities specifically relative to the orchard community um, in that part of, in my part of the Finger Lakes where I'm working, um, there's about uh, actually only 80 or so species only that we collect on um, apple blossoms uh, over 10 years of sampling in apple orchards. Um, and I think that so far, um, I have about a 50 or 60% overlap with that community. Um, the New York broader um, species list is 417. Um, but we, of course, that includes many of the smaller, more regional or specialized habitats. So of like the bulk of it, I am getting a large number. Um, yeah, it's it's not uh, an equal proportion cross section, so it definitely seems as though there is um, kind of a community of forest bees um, with really uh, some of the forest nesting um, sweat bees, a lot of specific andrina, including some andrina or mining bees that we didn't even think um, were necessarily forest associated or who for whom there are no nesting records. Um, and I'm going to be really excited to resolve my pollen networks that those bees have um, to really understand a little bit more of what they're doing. Um, but yeah, comparing them to the broader community is is definitely the question. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, so, sorry, folks, but we are running out of time. We're nearly at the end. And so if you're interested in finding our previous episodes of The Wild World of Bees, visit OregonBeeAtlas.org and follow The Wild World of Bees link to check out our, or check out our Atlas YouTube channel. Um, let's see. Next month, in four weeks from now, Professor Jim Rivers, a community ecologist and wildlife biologist here at OSU, will be joining us on June 11th at 7 p.m. to discuss forest pollinator health and ecology in Oregon's Coast Range, another great bees and trees talk. And it'll be the same bee time and same bee channel. Now, if you're interested in joining, so this is Jim's talk. If you're interested in joining the Oregon Bee Atlas or becoming a master melatologist, and that's someone who studies wild bees. You can find more information on our website by following the Master Melatologist link. So this is our website here. You'll have to sign up to join. 
And then finally, projects like the Atlas are supported by grants and especially by donations. Please consider giving a gift to the Oregon Bee Atlas at any level or contact us to discuss endowments. Now, before you leave, you'll be prompted to complete a short survey asking you about topics you'd like to hear about in the future. Please take a minute to let us know what you're interested in hearing about. We would love to know. And thank you so much, Cass. That was amazing. Thank you so much for having me. It was really wonderful to be here with you guys virtually. This is so good. Um, um, I may find myself climbing trees soon. Although oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's really a good time. It's, it's actually pretty meditative. So I was, would recommend. <laughs> so thanks everyone for tuning in and we will see you in June.